Welcome to Being Brainy, brought to you by the Brain Research New Zealand. My name is Bronwyn and I'm a neuroscientist, or in other words, a brain scientist. And it's my job to study and work out how the brain works. And if something goes wrong with the brain, how do we work out how to fix it? What we're going to do today is I'm going to teach you some really cool pieces of information about the brain and we're going to do some experiments. And what you need to do in order to do these experiments is you need to get yourself some paper and a pen or a pencil. Now, first thing I want you to think about is what is your brain? Why do you think it's important? What does it look like? What does it actually do? Is it made up for different, of different parts? And I want you to take your piece of paper and your pen or pencil, and I want you to draw what you think your brain looks like. So here we've got our friend Dan, the brain, just to give you a bit of an idea what they might look like. And I want you to draw what you think the brain looks like. And if you think the brain has different pieces to it, in different areas, then draw that in as well. Be creative. Think about whether the brain's rough or smooth, what color do you think it might be, and think about what it might feel like if you were to hold the brain. Now, this is a picture of a real brain, a real human brain. Does your picture look like this? So you can see the shape of the brain. This is the front of the brain here, and this is the back. And down here, we have the brain stem that connects to the spinal cord. This funny looking bit at the back here, which some people say look a bit like cauliflower, is what we call the cerebellum. And you can see that the brain is not smooth. It's all wrinkly and folded, and it has these deep creases and folds in it. And we'll talk a bit more about these as we go along in this session. Look at the color of the brain and look at the texture. It looks like it's, apart from the bumps all over it, the bits here are all quite smooth. And if the brain had blood flowing through it, it would be a little more pink than this brain here. So what we're now gonna do is just think about what exactly the brain does. So the brain basically controls everything we do. It's the organ that controls the whole body. It controls how you feel. It controls your emotions. It controls whether you're happy or sad, angry or scared. It tells you what you're seeing, what you're hearing, what you're tasting or smelling. And if you touch something with your fingers, it tells you whether it's rough or smooth hot or cold. Your brain tells your body how to move, to run, to re reach out to touch the door. And also, the area of your brain known as the brain stem controls all those things that you don't think about, such as breathing, your heart beating, digesting food, and a whole lot of other things that is happening in your body all the time that you're not thinking about. Now your brain is made up of a huge number of cells and the cells of different, and there were different types of cells within your brain. The main cells that we talk about are the neurons or the ones that talk to each other and tell the brain pieces of information, send that information to your muscles or to your heart or to your lungs. And your brain has around about 80 to 100 billion neurons the cells that communicate and talk to them, each other and to your body. And that's the number of neurons that you have in your brain is more than the number of stars that there are in the Milky Way. So if you've ever got a really clear night and you're looking up at the stars and you can see the Milky Way, you can think that you've got more neurons in your brain than there are stars in the sky. Now, the main thing we need to think about is keeping our brain safe and protected. So if you think about the picture of the brain I just showed you, 
it looks like it was fairly soft and squishy. And actually, if you pick up and hold a brain, it feels a bit like firm jelly, okay? So you can sort of hold it, but it's a bit squishy, okay? And so if you banged it against something, it would get damaged really easily. The main thing that we have that's protecting our brain, of course, is our skull here. Hard, bony skull, and inside it is your brain. Your brain is also wrapped in two different layers. The first layer is a bit like glad wrap that you wrap around food. And the other layer outside of that is a bit like brown wrapping paper, so a little bit tougher. And then you have the skull. But basically your brain is only connected to your body by your spinal cord running down the back of your neck here. And inside your skull, your brain is actually floating in a liquid that's known as cerebral spinal fluid. So it's just floating around. And it's the cerebral spinal fluid that actually really helps protect your brain if you bang your head or get hit by something on the head. So not only this nice tough um, skull here, but also the fact that the brain is floating. And I'm gonna do an experiment now just to show you what, am, what I actually mean. So what I have here is I have a jar, okay? Good old Nutella jar. And what I'm gonna do, so this jar is meant to be your skull, okay? You take the lid off. And I have an egg, okay? Normal egg, not hard boiled or anything. And this is meant to be your brain. So I'm going to pop the brain into our jar, which is our skull. Okay, and I'm going to put the lid on, nice and tight. And I'm going to give the jar a big shake. So what do you think is going to happen? I think we all know what's going to happen, but let's give it a go. Ah, okay. And so what we've done is we've created scrambled egg with eggshell. So if your brain was just sitting there in air, inside your skull, and it had a big shake or a bang, it would get damaged, as you can see, which is not what we want. Okay, so now I'm gonna take the jar, or the skull, and what I've done is I have filled it up with water. And the water is meant to be the cerebral spinal fluid that's in your brain. So you've got the skull on the outside, cerebral spinal fluid in here, now I'm going to pop our egg brain into the jar. Okay, so there we have our egg brain floating in our jar. Put the lid on really tight. Okay, now I'm going to give it a shake. Shaking, shaking, shaking as hard as I can. And nothing happens. No cracks, no nothing. So the reason is because the egg is floating and the water is protecting it from banging against the glass. Okay, really, 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 really big hits and we still can't break the egg, okay? And so that's the same thing, the cerebral spinal fluid is protecting the egg or the brain inside our glass or our skull here, okay? And that's why the cerebral spinal fluid is really important. However, of course, if you still, if you bang your head really badly and you're not wearing your bike helmet or if you're in a car accident and you've not got your seatbelt on and you bang your head against the windscreen and you crack your skull or you have a really bad bang on the skull there and you bruise your brain, then the cerebral spinal fluid, unfortunately, is still not going to be enough to protect it. So that's why we get you to wear your bike helmet when you're biking or skateboarding or riding your scooter, and also why we tell you to put your seatbelt on when you're in a car. And just making sure that you protect that really important organ called the brain. Now the next thing we're going to look at is the different areas of the brain. So we said that the brain of course is not smooth, okay, and it's got these great big deep lines in them. And these lines, or these big folds, are what we call gyri, or gyrus, if there's only one of them. And these gyri 
we can use to help work out the positions of the areas of the brain. The parts that aren't folded, the smooth bits here, like this bit here, is known as the sulky or the sulcus. Now, your brain is divided into two hemispheres, the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere, or the left side and the right side. And as well as talking to your body, your brain also has to talk between the two sides. So the left and the right hemisphere talk to each other. And they do that across this fiber pathway that goes from the left side of the brain, goes across here to the right side of the brain, okay? So this is as if we'd taken the brain and we'd cut, cut it in half here, down this way, okay? And so the left side here talking to the right side and the right side talking to the left side. And that's really important so that both sides of the brain know what's going on. Because remember, the left side of your brain controls the right side of your body, and the right side of your brain controls the left side of your body. And if the two sides don't know what's going on, then they might start to do some really funny things, and you might start doing some really funny things. So the left and right side need to be aware of what the other side's doing so that you don't go and do some really funny, weird movements. If we want to look at it the other way, this is cutting, this is one side or one hemisphere of the brain. And here we can see this corpus callosum, this fiber tract that we talked about here, going right from the front all the way through to the back of the brain so that all the brain, all the neurons that are communicating can, tra can traverse from the left to the right side of the brain. And here I've got some examples of what different brains look like from different animals. So not all brains look the same. Here we have a rat brain, a cat brain, a chimpanzee brain, a human brain, and a dolphin brain. Now have a look at these pictures carefully and see if you can spot some major differences. So let's see if you spotted one of the major differences. One of the major differences is how folded the brains are. So if you look at the rat brain, for example, it's completely smooth. There are no gyri or no folds on it at all. The cat brain has a few more folds or gyri, but if you compare it to the human brain and then to the dolphin brain, which is really folded, you can see that as we go up in size and in um, terms of using and developing language, the brain becomes more and more folded. And it's language that makes your brain get the wrinkles. So as you develop communication, speaking, making sounds, communicating with language, the areas of the brain that were involved with this grew bigger. And so in order to fit inside your skull, the brain had to squish itself in, but like shoving newspaper into a, into a cup. And so the rat, which doesn't have a sophisticated language, has a smooth brain, the cat has a fairly smooth brain, but animals such as or humans and dolphins, for example, which have really sophisticated language, lots and lots of different sounds in their language, they have really wrinkled brains because those areas are really developed. And so, as I said to you, we can use those gyri to actually work out the different regions of the brain. And different areas of the brain have different jobs. So just reminding you, this is where your eyes are, and this is the back of your head here. And this is the brain stem going down to the spinal cord. So we talked about the brain stem just at the top of the spinal cord and how that is involved in regulating um, all those things that you don't think about, such as your heartbeat, uh, breathing, digesting food. So that just sits down here. Now the main areas you can get divided by what we call the central, central sulcus or central gyri that goes down here and this lateral sulcus or lateral gyri that goes across this way here, okay? And that divides down the center and this divides across the center this way. And so at the front here, by your eyes, we have what's known as the frontal lobe. And the frontal lobe is involved in planning, decision-making, personality, emotion, and, um, and learning and memory, as well as music. The other one here we've got is the parietal lobe, and this has got a really specialized skill. 
the parietal lobe is involved in what we call spatial awareness. So that's being aware of everything that's around you. So knowing that the desk is over there or the door is over there or you've got a chair that you're walking past, making sure you don't hit those objects, making sure that you can reach out and touch certain objects called spatial awareness. The other thing it's really important for is facial recognition. So that's looking at someone and remembering, oh, yep, I know you, that's Tom. Or looking at the face and going, yep, that's my mum. But also recognising things such as whether someone's happy or sad um, or angry. So facial recognition. Right at the back here, we have what's known as the occipital lobe or sometimes called the visual cortex. And it's really weird that this is right at the back of the brain, seeing as your eyes are right at the front. So you'd sort of think that the part of the brain that's involved in, in, in working out what you're seeing would be right at the front here, but it's not, it's right at the back. And the reason why it's right at the back is because it needs, the information that comes into your eyes needs a whole lot of processing before it gets to the occipital lobe in order to help you work out what you see. And it's not just what you see, but also where it is and things that we talked about with the parietal lobe, such as spatial and facial, spatial awareness and facial recognition. So we have pathways that go from the eyes and they go all the way through here, through the parietal lobe. So the parietal lobe can work out where things are in relation to your body, how far things away things are, and also work out facial recognition, emotions of people that you're looking at. And then that all gets processed together here in the occipital lobe. So it's a lot of information to get taken in from your eyes. It's a lot of processing by regions of the brain until it gets to the occipital lobe that puts it all together. And then the last area we have here is the temporal lobe. And this is really important for learning and memory. Um, and also this is the area where you have language. So speech, reading and writing is in the temporal lobe here. So a very important region. And then at the back here, this funny cauliflower looking shape here, the cerebellum. So the cerebellum is involved in balance and movement coordination. So when you go and stand on one leg and balance on one leg, what you're doing is you're using your cerebellum to help make sure that you can stay standing and balancing on one leg. And so the cerebellum has a very important role in, in your balance and in your ability to walk and not fall over. Okay, so those are all the things that we're going to talk about today. Hopefully you have learnt some of the areas of the brain, learnt about why your brain is so wrinkly, and have a better idea about some of the jobs that different areas of the brain do, as well as just exactly what your brain might feel like and look like if you saw it. Now, if you're really good and ask mum and dad, they might let you, you do the egg in the jar experiment, but make sure you get their permission first, because the last thing mum or dad wants is egg spilt all over the house. But have fun, hope you learnt lots, and we'll see you next time.